Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Covent Garden. My name is Dan Schreiber. I am sitting here with Anna Chizinski, James Harkin, and Andy Murray. And once again, we've gathered around the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with you, James. Okay, my fact this week is that the Great Wall of China is held together by sticky rice. Right. This is not true. It's true. <laughs> it's true. How is that possible? Well, it's the mortar that holds the bricks together. It must be extremely overcooked because I don't think that's good sticky rice if it's like cement. Well, what they found is that um, they've got this kind of mortar which is half organic and half inorganic. And the organic compounds in it is something called amylopectin. Uh, which is like a starchy stuff that you would get if you cook potatoes or rice or whatever. And they're pretty certain that they got that through cooking sticky rice and then extracting this starch and then just mixing it with lime and making the mortar. Wow. That's really cool. Wow. Yeah. I've always thought food would make great cement because have you ever left a sort of the remnants of a Weetabix yeah, bowl? Yeah, Weetabix. Weetabix. Food, right? Why are we not using Weetabix to hold buildings together? You're right. You leave it five minutes. You cannot wash that up. It's without... done. Yeah. You might as well. I throw away the bowls. <laughs> <laughs> that is why we're out of crockery in the office. <laughs> <laughs> it's very cool so how much of the great wall was used so um the great wall started being built 2200 years ago okay. uh, and this mortar came in 1500 years ago uh, and so it's not all of the wall but the main bit which was um built by the ming dynasty the bit that you kind of see in the photos uh, that has sticky rice in it that's okay. all the all the fancy towers and really good bits of yeah, wall. Yeah, yeah. Not the, yeah. like, earthen mounds. Yeah. Yeah. Which aren't even really the Great Wall of China, are they? They're, they're, I heard them described as the uh, the Qi Wall, which is spelled the QI Wall, which is quite nice. Um, but it was built in 500 BC, and it's mostly just earth. But it was really quite effective, because if you're yeah. an infantry army trying to cross that, you can cross it, but A, it'll take loads of time, and B, you'll probably have to leave some supplies behind, and it's just a pain. Yeah, the mm-hmm. thing yeah. is, that is great, and it's a wall, and it's in China, so I think we should call that the Great yep, Wall of China enough. as well. <laughs> yeah, and that was that was by the emperor who kind of created China, modern-day China, yeah. I guess, um, who was incredible character. Emperor Qi. Emperor Qi. And he was a terracotta warriors guy. He yeah. was... Uh, it's amazing when you look at what he did in one lifetime. Yeah. I mean, he killed a lot of people in the process, but it's... it's Apparently, we shouldn't hold that against yeah. him. <laughs> he had an army of 1.5 million men. Wow. Which, Imagine if the Grand Old Duke of York had an army of 1.5 million men. Wow. <laughs> the hill would be full. It would be very, very hard. <laughs> There's no room to go back down. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that they've now... Um, they've trying to combat the thing of everyone going on the wall and graffitiing it. And so they've actually created a section that you can legally graffiti now on the Great Wall Have of China. They? Yeah, there's a graffiti corner. Uh, that seems a crazy idea. I saw that. I can't quite believe it. Mm. It, it kind of makes sense. Very, But it does take the fun out of graffiti, though. Yeah, when it's, it's allowed. Only, hey, guys, welcome to the cool graffiti area <laughs> where you can draw what you like on the wall. So, you know, last week, I think I mentioned that uh, they've just realized there are eight times as many trees as we thought there were on right. Earth, which if it was edited out, that's a fact for this week's podcast. There are eight <laughs> times as many trees as we thought there were. We've just miscounted. And so in the same way, they recently measured the Great Wall of China, and it's like three times longer than we thought it was. Were all the trees behind it? It's, <laughs> they were hiding. <laughs> <laughs> but how did we get that wrong? So we thought it was uh, 9,000 kilometers, and then it turns out they've just announced it's 21,000. So cool. That's halfway around the Earth. That's half the circumference of the Earth. Wow. If stretched wow. out. And it's all sorts of different bits folded in on itself and so on. But yeah. yeah, it's lots of lit- uh, different walls, isn't it? It's not actually yeah. one proper wall. Well, depending on whether you go with James's, it's all definitely the Great Wall of China theory. <laughs> Every single wall in China, <laughs> which I consider to be great. <laughs> <laughs> um apparently the so i've been to the great wall of china have you yeah um so have i have you yeah i was reading well actually i wasn't reading i saw this in a carl pilkington idiot abroad documentary <laughs> episode <laughs> where he visited there and he was reading a little pamphlet in it where it said basically that section most people go to has been renovated so much that it's basically a whole new wall it's it's just it's all oh. new bricks so since 1983 that's what people are visiting a sort of 1983 version of the Great Wall of China. Wow. Yeah. Which is probably safer because mm. so many people are visiting it 
Um, I read somewhere saying it's really ironic that considering it was designed to keep people out, it's now one of China's biggest tourist attractions. Mm. Yeah. It attracts millions of people to it every year. Yeah. Um, was it definitely to keep people out? I remember once reading that it was a place to collect tax or something. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Do you know um, what you're thinking of? What? The Great Hedge of India. Am I? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there's India. Uh, there's a huge hedge that runs along, and it was uh, it was a borderline to collect tax on, and so you'd get to the hedge, and there might be someone patrolling the hedge, and they would collect tax or something like Did that. Did they call the tax the hedge fund? Ooh, nice. Oh. Yeah, okay. I didn't. <laughs> um, do you guys know who the first person to be filmed on the Great Wall of China was? Justin Bieber. No. Chem- <laughs> Chairman Mao. No. For a movie, sorry, I, who was, I should who say. Who's closer? Uh, James saying Justin Bieber James. Or James. Yes, Steven Seagal. So close in name. <laughs> Steven Seagal. No, so okay. um, <laughs> Steve Coogan. What? Steve Coogan was the first ever person to be filmed. He made a movie called Around the World in 80 Days. It was the Jules Verne movie. Oh, and yeah. He's the first oh, person to be filmed in it for a movie. They got access to it for the first time ever. It had never been featured in a film before. Like it, it had yeah. never been. Well, if it had been on. featured, it was just wow. purely a, a shot, as opposed to someone walking and doing dialogue. Or it on would it. have been a set or something. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Um, so on the Great Wall of China, you know the whole thing about whether you can see it from space or yeah. not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, in 2003, China sent its first astronaut, or they, as they call them, Tycho Nord, because Tycho is uh, Chinese for space. Uh, they, they sent the first astronaut up, uh, Yang Liwei, and he said guys i can't see it and everyone panicked <laughs> it's and it gone. was a really big problem and um eventually they decided you could see it but actually you can only see it from a really low orbit when the weather's good and if you've got a powerful telephoto lens yeah, yeah. yeah. they should paint it pink yeah they, they should do something <laughs> different because it's quite it, they do really care about it every single chinese astronaut that's been up uh has been given the role of looking for the Great Wall of China <laughs> yeah. and has failed to find. So the photos that they did get, the astronaut who took the photos where you could see it if you looked really closely and sort of blew it up quite to a big photo, he said he just didn't know if it was in the photo at the time when he took it. So it was by coincidence that he managed to get it. And in 2006, um, so someone went on television in China associated with their space program. And this is what he said. He said, we need to carry out more tests and improve astronaut training. So, I'm astro- <laughs> so that's like still their main focus. It's like, no, we don't want to write it off just yet. Um, but do you know when it dates back to? It dates back to before um, it's like 300 astronauts. BC, isn't it? Well, the earliest I found is uh, Ripley of Believe It or Not fame. In 1932, he said that it's the mightiest work of man. It was the only one that would be visible to the human eye from the moon, which it definitely isn't. But there was a writer in 1754 called William Stukeley who said, and this was about Hadrian's Wall, he said, uh, it's a mighty wall of four score miles in length, which makes a considerable figure on the terrestrial globe and may be discerned at the moon. Wow. And that was about Hadrian's Wall. I know. Which you can barely see from like standing on tiptoes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I wonder amazing. if um, Helen Sharman had a look down to see if she could see Hadrian's Wall. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and if not, I think we need to send some more Brits up to <laughs> yeah. see if we can see it or not. Any more training. Tim Peake's going up. We could give him a special uh, mission to do it. Um, that's what I really like, by the way. Uh, the first mention that you could see it from the moon was the Ripley's Believe It or Not book. Mm. And I didn't realize that Ripley's Believe It or Not was an actual question. And that's what it feels like. Okay, so not. I don't believe it. <laughs> it feels like it's an actual... God, is that what the whole, like, 50% of that book we're saying is false? Maybe we've falsehoods. been all reading it wrong, yeah. Damn it. So I was looking at Sticky Rice because um, I thought it's surely more interesting than the Great Wall of China. So um, every year in Japan, they eat these sticky rice cakes and the health departments had to advise people that before they eat the cakes, they need to cut them into small pieces, chew them slowly, and learn how to perform basic first aid before indulging because so many people keep choking on them. Wow. I think maybe it's the same substance that they used to build the Great Wall because it's <laughs> yeah. people just, there's an epidemic. Maybe it's drying up and lodging in their throat like a concrete ball. <laughs> it's and, doing and, that. Yeah, you can't <laughs> swallow it down. Um, did you know that an Italian bride recently was rushed to hospital because... People were showering her with rice as she was exiting the church, and she got a bit of rice stuck in her ear and uh, had to be hurried to the ER. She was okay. There's a, like a common uh, myth that if you throw rice on the ground, then pigeons, pigeons will eat explode. it and it'll explode, but it's not true. Ah. Have we ever tested it? <laughs> no, um, I don't really want to do that experiment <laughs> just on the off chance that <laughs> Snopes is wrong on this one. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Should we pause sure. the podcast right now? <laughs> <laughs> Came back 20 minutes later. Oh my God, there is <laughs> blood and guts everywhere. Trafalgar Square is a mess. <laughs> Should we move on soon to our next fact? Yeah, I have one more thing on the Great Wall. Yeah. Um, 
just going along the uh, Steve Coogan line, yeah, the first man we think to walk the complete Great Wall of China was an American. Oh. It was an American adventurer called William Edgar Guile, and he was a really incredible guy. And he trekked across Africa, and he travelled along the Yangtze River. He did all these amazing expeditions, and no one's heard of him these days. It was the late nineteenth century, and um, when he died, he left three thousand dollars to commission a biography of himself. <laughs> <laughs> he, he wrote, "My life has been unusual, and the story of it is likely to benefit young people," <laughs> which is very, very confident. And he he wanted it. He wrote the first ever book in the West about the Great Wall of China, and he said it, he wanted it to be so good that any historians in future writing about it would find little to write about unless he pirated our notes. Um, just one more thing about rice. Yeah. yeah. Have you guys heard of uh, Daki Gokochi? And I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Almost certainly not. But in Japan, this was a tradition. In 2008, it suddenly became a craze where you get a rice-filled bag and you draw a baby's face on it. If you've got a friend who's had a baby <laughs> and you present that to them as a gift. And you, so you try to draw the baby that they've had, like an image of it, on a bag of rice. Right. And that's your baby warming present. That's weird, isn't it? Mm. What purpose is that serving? Is it like in those um, sitcoms where they give uh, a child like a bag of flour to look after as if it was a baby? I had that at my Did school. You? Yeah, I went to a really backward school, it strikes me sometimes <laughs> when I think, yeah, we had to care for a flour baby in year seven. Yeah, so do you think maybe it's the same kind of thing? If you look after the rice and don't accidentally boil it, <laughs> it means you're okay for looking after or, babies. Or if you must accidentally boil one of these two things that you've just got, yeah. make sure it's the rice. <laughs> That's very confusing, though, because you think oh that's lovely i'll have that rice for my supper <laughs> oh no <laughs> <laughs> or it's like well i need some mortar to put up this brick wall <laughs> oh no <laughs> okay time for fact number two and that is andrew hunter murray my fact is that the world's largest single-celled organism can get up to 12 inches long that's great that's yeah. incredible yeah. yeah it's amazing what is it it's an algae or an alga, mm -hmm. uh, it's called Calepa taxifolla, and it's a single cell, and yet it gets up to a foot long, and it has all these different things in it. It has, um, so it looks like a plant. It has these fronds which look like leaves, and then it's got little root-like bits as well, which hold it in place. But it is one cell. Wow! It's so cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Single-celled organisms, I've realised, are much more complicate. Can be much more complicated and interesting than you would imagine. Like, there's one that's recently been discovered that has kind of what they think are eyes, isn't mm. there? Um, which take up about a third of its body, and it is just one cell. Are you it's talking minuscule. about one or weeds? I sure am. Yeah. Um, or what? What are they called? Ocelli. They're called ocelloids. Ocelloids. I like um, things, little black dots inside the um, single-celled organism, and it seems like they appropriate bacteria to be used as their eye. Yeah. What? Wow. Yeah, so the cornea, what you would count as a cornea, is actually yeah. a little bacterium, and the retina, which you, what you would think is similar to a human retina, is actually another bacterium. Wow. That's amazing. I know. But then have they become a multicellular organism? That's a good point. But this was discovered, wasn't it, more than 100 years ago by this guy who saw it under the microscope and said, look, this thing has eyes. And uh, no one believed him. And so it was one of those things that we just assumed it didn't have eyes for another 120 years. Wow. Do you think until... he went, believe it or not, <laughs> this thing has eyes? Okay, Frank, we don't believe it. <laughs> I, uh, I saw a fish today with four eyes. Did you? Hmm? What? Yeah, it's called the four eye fish yeah. and it has four eyes. Is this a, is this the beginning of a joke? No. Uh, Where uh, were you this morning? I went <laughs> in to an a, aquarium. I went to yeah, I went to the Horniman Museum oh. and uh which is uh got an aquarium in it and yeah, uh, they have one of those things as a four eye so fish. So I think the point is they have like kind of two eyes like a normal fish but then the top of one eye is got a certain lens and the bottom has a certain lens so they can see outside the water as well as inside the yeah. water. Is that right? This is insane. That's so cool. Um, the joke you were thinking of was, I saw a fish with no eyes. A fish. Yes. Yeah, that's oh. that's what I thought you were screwing up there. Yeah, <laughs> But you weren't. It was just an interesting fact. What do you call a fish with four eyes? A fish. <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, sorry, there's another amazing single-celled organism which does a thing that's kind of similar to that. Um, and this is called the uh, Xenophyophrese, which I think was the biggest known single-celled organism before yours came along. Uh, Xenophyophore means bearer of foreign objects. 
And that's because it makes it sort of constructs its own body out of stuff that's lying around. So it kind of picks up bits of like dirt and dust and material wow. off the ground and bacteria. Like a Mr. Potato Head. It's exactly like a Mr. Potato <laughs> Head. Wow. Yes. Um, so I the, just remember, sorry, I just was talking about Mr. Potato Head, just a little fact about that. Yeah. Um, when Mr. Potato Head came out, it was during rationing in America and <laughs> no one wanted to advertise it. None of the advertisers would advertise it because they thought it would encourage children to play with their food. <laughs> and so until the rationing stopped they couldn't really they couldn't really, really advertise it anywhere yeah or wow. it could encourage children to eat plastic which <laughs> is inadvisable a... <laughs> yeah. it had a face on it i thought it was a baby <laughs> <laughs> sorry dan no um, i was just going to say so there's a diy living thing that builds itself as it goes well yeah. it, it, it kind gives of itself bu- extensions it kind of builds a house for itself um but in the deep sea there are these xeno firefalls there are up to 2000 every 100 square meters Wow. On the seabed. Wow. That's ama- they're, they're the kings down there. Yeah. Yeah. They're the kings, really, one celled organisms of the world. <laughs> There are, they way mm. outnumber multicellular organisms, don't they? Um, there are many really? more of them than there are of us. Yeah. So we're animals, and we and at the very top level of taxon- taxonomy is uh, domain. I think everyone else learned this in Year Nine Biology, and I snoozed <laughs> that lesson. But I don't know. There are three domains, and every living thing that you know of fits into one. So animals, plants, fungi, everything you think mm. of as an animal fits into one. And then there are two whole different domains for just these bacteria, basically. Yeah. You know. All when over everyone the else place. was learning that at school, Anna was sweeping up flour from the <laughs> floor. <laughs> um, just on the idea of so single cell organisms, when I think of that, I just think of the earliest of life. Oh, like yeah. that's how we we all came about, right? Yeah. So I was looking into early life and and how we came about generally, and I read about a thing that has been observed in deep space, uh, seven hundred and fifty light years away from Earth. Uh, it's a proto star. It's like a sun like star shooting out these huge bullets of water and they actually think that that's how water is getting seeded around the universe from these kind of stars these huge like huge amounts of water uh and so they say that um if we picture these jets as giant hoses and the water droplets as bullets the amount of shooting out equals a hundred million times the water flowing through the amazon river every second wow yeah and their velocities are reaching two hundred thousand kilometers per hour so 80, fast, 80 times faster than bullets flying out of a machine gun. And they've been observing this, these huge batches of water coming out of these stars. And because I did read a long time ago, there was a theory that maybe the way that Earth got water was from one of these, a huge, just whatever, bullet of water coming towards us. Wow. Or ice, I guess. But um, <laughs> well, they yeah. think, do, do they think maybe comets? Because comets often have yes. loads yeah, of ice yeah. on them. I think an enormous comet might have provided a lot of... I can't imagine that much water coming just yeah. from comets, though. It's, it's controversial, incredible. I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, this this is just a yeah. this is quite a new report that's come out where they've observed a proto star shooting out a super yeah. soaker fifty nine million <laughs> <Yes>. somewhere <laughs> in the universe. That's so amazing. Yeah, I know. I couldn't believe it. But you you think it's uh, not fully I, a thing? I, don't, I haven't read that article, right. but. Um, some people think that water came from space. Some people think it managed to be made on Earth. But um, it might well be true, for all I know. Speaking of early life forms, uh, do you guys know about the Boring Billion? No. <laughs> the boring billion is a period of time that scientists use to describe between 1.8 billion and 800 million years ago when life just stopped evolving completely and the whole of earth <laughs> the only life on earth was one huge layer of slime <laughs> that is so good for a billion years the boring nothing billion. Happened. was it like slime mold kind of amoeba kind of stuff or? um it was it was like a um uh what's it called a bacterial sheet I'll, am I actually just like fine? a mat kind of thing? Yeah, oh, it was like a microbial like mat. microbial mats. Yeah. You still get microbial mats today. Uh, there's a huge patch of them, the size of what the size is of it? Greece, I think. Yeah, there's one. Wow. There's one layer of microbial mats on the bottom of the ocean. It's just off Venezuela, and it's the size of Greece, and it can be up to seven centimeters thick, as in bottom to top. And it's just this incredible web of strands and filaments and microbes living in these, they look like little cow pats on the ocean floor. And there's an area the size of Greece, undersea, which is these things. As excited as Andy is getting about <laughs> this, I think he would have loved it in the boring billions. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you should have been living in that time, Andy. I would have called it the brilliant billion. <laughs> Um, I, I randomly was flicking through the other day a um, book by Michael Palin on his trip to Brazil, and the book's called Brazil, and uh, he was talking to a guy in the Amazon, 
about uh, deforestation and so on and when they're actually just chopping down stuff. And this guy said that the term that they all refer to when they talk about a size of area that they're deforesting in the Amazon, they call it one Belgium or six Belgiums. Oh, do they? Yeah, they use Belgium as the... uh... We would say Wales, I think. Like the size of Wales is chopped down every two minutes or something right yeah, yeah. so they they seem to cool. like they'll say to each other so they kind of use it as an unofficial really? really unit of measurement yeah um something about bacteria oh yeah um so the largest bacterium is called theo margarita namibiensis that's yeah. actually quite a pretty name it sounds like a parent's actually named a child Dad. it is i i tried to look up if there was anyone called theo margarita in the world <laughs> and um there was one guy he's a football agent or he's signed up to be a football agent but there's not really much about him he, he didn't <laughs> seem that interesting but it's a shame um, but yeah this is the um, biggest bacteria in the world it's big enough to be seen with a naked eye and its volume is three million times more than the average bacterium and i thought that if um you had the average human and it was someone who was three million times bigger than that <laughs> it would be about 10 times as large as the world's biggest tree wow. it would be human wow. that size wow yeah you don't want to be bullied by that guy no <laughs> Uh, there are th- those these things are so cool yeah. so um th- i think it's the thickness of seven pages in in a book if you hold those together uh, mm-hmm. that's the width that's that's how long they get so you mm-hmm. can see them another thing about them is that these bacteria l- the world's largest bacteria is the same size as the world's smallest snail <laughs> oh, do they hang out? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but that's called Acmella nana, and it was only described um, this month, November 2015. Wow, imagine really if you're new. that snail and you're like, oh, I feel like I'm just coming down with a bit of a bug <laughs> that's actually the same size as me. Right, cool. And those two are both slightly larger than the very smallest plant in the world, which is a duckweed, and it gets just 0.6 millimeters. That's an individual plant. Oh, wow. It's uh, tiny. So I like to imagine all three of them. And then having, having a little having a reason, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, this is just one thing I like about, because you mentioned it, giving things their scientific names. The binomial naming system, uh, yeah. it just struck me the other day when I read it in a book, that um, it's one of the only, maybe the only universal bit of language. So wherever you go in the world, you're not going to be able to communicate with anyone you know, who speaks a language you don't, unless you need to describe a certain type of plant or a mole or something. And then you just say, you know, puffiness, puffiness, and they're going to know exactly what you mean if <laughs> they're a zoologist. I wonder about computer code is a bit similar to that, maybe. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing is, apparently, there's one word which is understood by everyone on Earth, and that's, huh? <laughs> uh, there was a paper earlier this year saying that this word is, everyone knows what that means. Huh? Do you have to make that ridiculous face with it that you just made? <laughs> <laughs> that I wish everyone could see. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I started researching single-celled organisms um, and then quickly stopped because I didn't understand anything about it. Um, so I looked at the rest of the fact, which is uh, that the single-cell organism can be up to 12 inches long. Mm. If so, you're going to name stuff that's 12 inches long, Dan, I don't know if we want to put out this podcast. <laughs> are you about to name other stuff that's 12 inches long? Yeah. Oh, God. So I started looking into things that are 12 inches long. Uh, <laughs> one of the things is that two years ago, uh, Subway got sued um, because customers were complaining that their 12 inch foot long sandwiches weren't in fact 12 inch foot longs wow. and so yeah and you so- could bring in your single celled organism to measure it <laughs> against <laughs> <laughs> yeah. exactly and someone actually there was a big class action lawsuit and they were representing customers who'd purchased the six inch foot long sandwiches anytime between january the 1st 2003 and october the 2nd 2015 so if anyone felt like they were duped and had a bit of proof they could come forward and say wow. actually six years ago i was pretty sure that was a bit shorter than that a foot long like 11.9 inches yeah exactly and they had to pay up so uh subway <laughs> actually paid up for the settlement of five hundred and twenty five thousand dollars american and now they have to measure all of their uh bread um okay. but they could have just claimed that oh sorry when we said foot long we just meant as long as michael's foot <laughs> michael's the <laughs> guy in the office michael <laughs> <laughs> oh, Michael Foot was much bigger than a, he was five or six feet actually. So, um, can I give a really interesting theory? I think about single-celled organisms that yeah. I read today. I, it might be quite random. I only read it in this one um, study. <laughs> was but... it in Ripley's Believe It or Not? <laughs> it sure was. Was um... it in the second half of the book? <laughs> um, but so it's it's quite a mystery why animals happened why multi-celled yeah. organisms happened you know what what was it that made single cells go to multi-cells there are various theories i like this theory which is that is because we're able to eat ourselves um so 
in so cells need organisms need food to survive right so they eat other cells mm-hmm. um, other things that are made of cells so when cells were all clustered together if they got hungry they could just eat the cell next to them that they were attached to so that meant they never got hungry but the cells that were single celled organisms couldn't fight if they got hungry and there wasn't another single cell nearby then they just starved to death and so suddenly it evolved that it's better to be you know multi-celled organisms happened because you could just eat the other bits of yourself so you can right. digest yourself easily without having to go out looking for food and that's why uh, they wow. came into being um in sark the island of sark there is a jail with a single cell. <laughs> <laughs> you can fit two prisoners in it at a push. And they have to be amoeba. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to know a cool thing about what I think is the oldest animal on Earth? Mm-hmm. Mm. So, Ooh, any okay. guesses? It's... Um, a tortoise. Okay. A it was something ocean-based, right? So, was, well, was, yeah. Like coral. Bruce Forsyth. I think. <laughs> no, that... Dan's right on this one. Oh, um, damn it. <laughs> so sponges are technically animals, which never fails to surprise me. Oh, they yes. are in the animal kingdom, and they, they look just like sponges. But there are these giant barrel sponges, which can be up to two and a half meters tall and that much across as well, single animals. And some of those, they think, could be up to 2,400 years old. Yeah, wow. which outstrips anything else. Do you know that you couldn't kill a sponge with your bare hands? I disagree. <laughs> yeah. Because if you kind of try and rip it apart or pull it or anything like that, it yeah. will just regrow. So how can they be killed? Uh, probably, let's say with fire. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were actually bringing them close to extinction because back in the day, before we used toilet paper, people would use sponges. So we were sort of bottom wiping them to death, basically, yeah, as a species. Then, as in bacteria would then get into the, the ecosystem. Is that right? Don't know. Oh. <laughs> Hang on, so we, that implies that we didn't take it off to wipe our asses. We just sat on a huge lot of sponge on the ocean. Oh, and you took it out and put it back. Put it back in. Okay, reattached it. In the old days, you had to swim to the bottom of the sea to wipe your bum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was terrible for the people living next to the Marianas Trench, wasn't it? <laughs> they called it the Marianas Trench. <laughs> I've got quite a cool thing on amoeba, actually. Just that. Uh, so the uh, there's an amoeba called the chaos amoeba, which I think is quite cool. <laughs> um, or it's a chaos is a genus of amoeba. And it was named by Linnaeus. And I think it was the first amoeba to be seen and named. And then this reminded me. So Linnaeus obviously was responsible for seeing a lot of these um, little species and naming them for the first time. And... I was reading a book the other day by Colin Tudge, who's amazing, and you should all read his books, that Linnaeus, when he went on botanical expeditions, would have a musical band leading the way and would make everyone dress in really wacky costumes. Yeah. Did, did everyone know that? And whenever so they cool. found a new species, he would like ring a bell or something like that yeah. or play a tutor horn or something. <laughs> See, I know you think the boring billion sounds fun, but I think that sounds like a more fun <laughs> day out. <laughs> we're all working out where in history we're going to go with our time machine. Yeah. Aren't we? <laughs> Andy's been gone a while. <laughs> I said, how long have you been some slime? <laughs> Okay, time for fact number three, and that is Chuzinski. My fact this week is that if you're bitten by the boom slang snake, you bleed from every orifice. Frightening. James yeah. finds it funny. Yeah. <laughs> I find the word orifice funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's pretty terrifying. Even your gums. Yeah, I mean, every every part of your body you could bleed from. Yeah, your gums, your eyes, your nose, Ooh, um, wow. your eight, you know, the bits down there. Your Mariana's the, trench. <laughs> your Mariana's trench, exactly. Uh, you've Mariana's. Got... <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I'm never calling it anything else <laughs> again. Anyway, so this is really horrible. Uh, we shouldn't be laughing. Um, no, but it's fine. This, the boom slang, slang snake, which is quite a cool name, is not mm. particularly dangerous because it very, very rarely attacks people. I think it's only killed seven people on record. Uh. But when it does kill you, it has a venom which is called a hemotoxin, which destroys your blood cells. And the first recorded incident was an expert on snakes who got bitten by it when he was in his lab and he thought nothing of it because it's just a tiny little bruise. And he actually, because he was a snake expert, he noted down the symptoms as they went along and spent the day going, oh, my bruise is looking a little bit purple. Oh, I'll get a little tiny bit sore now. And then he was dead within 24 hours because suddenly, mm. about you know, six to eight hours later, you start bleeding he was called everywhere. Schmidt, was he? Yes, I think he was. Yeah. And the, I think was it thought to be harmless at the time the yeah. boom slang? So he said, 
Yeah. If he'd been bitten by a snake then thought to be dangerous, he mm. obviously would have been really yeah. worried. But he just thought, oh, it's just a boom slang. I love, so the boom slang, um, so it's killed seven people uh, with its bite. I reckon it's only seven because it must be such an ordeal for it to actually bite someone properly because its fangs are located <laughs> at the back of its mouth. Yeah. <laughs> so for some ridiculous reason, evolution put it back there. So in order to bite, it has to open its mouth 170 degrees like this huge <laughs> <laughs> and then make the bite but that's that's just yeah. such an odd placement it's amazing yeah. and they're called they're called back fanged snakes aren't they and there are loads of species of snake which yeah i don't really understand it either supposedly when they bite you boom slangs they have to it looks as though they're chewing on their prey right supposedly when they bite their prey it looks as though they're chewing on them but actually all they're doing is working the venom into their prey oh, okay. but because they have to open their mouth so wide to get their fangs actually in there then they need to it looks like they're chomping yeah. on you have you guys heard of the japanese tiger keelback no no it no. is the most badass snake <laughs> this this snake is incredible so it can bite you and kill you with a poison with a toxin however it's a non-venomous snake and what it does is it bites poison frogs it takes from it the venom and the toxin from the toad, and then it lets it drip back to its back fangs as well, and it keeps it in these little, I think, pouches, and then it bites something, and it uses the poison that it's carried over wow. to kill its enemy. That's yeah. insane, right? That's amazing. Yeah. That's because it takes a lot of energy to make your own venom, doesn't it? And right. so it's actually really clever. It's much less energy to just go and nick it off someone else and like work mm. out with your test tubes inside your mm. body how to actually concoct one. Do they tell each other, though? Like, Do the snakes go... It's cool. There's no venom, but that toad will give you it. You just have to put it to yeah. your back to... Like, how do how they do pass they, that yeah. knowledge on? Is it like with beavers? They just know how to build dams when yeah. they're born. Are they keelbacks, did you say? Yeah. So um, female keelbacks, um, when they have babies and the babies don't have any venom yet, they'll find um, a, a toad and then collect the venom from the toad and then give it to the children so that they have some wow. have some venom when they're first born. So that might be observational. It could be, yeah. Ah. Yeah. Do you guys know how many people would you guess? I think I told Ali this the other day, so don't answer it. Right. How many people would you two guess per year are killed by snakes? Uh, around the world? Around the world, yeah. Um, I would say about 100. How many people do you reckon, Dan? Uh, oh God, I don't know. Uh, Maybe something ridiculously low, like seven, because we have so much... It's 200,000. What? Really? 200,000 people a year. They're the most dangerous yeah. animal aside from mosquitoes. And it's a massive health emergency because um, it's a really unfashionable thing for pharmaceutical companies to be investing in because mm. everywhere where snakes are dangerous is in like rural, yeah. developing the poorest areas. And so lots of pharmaceutical companies are stopping producing certain antivenom, which is killing a lot of people. But 200,000 people a year, that's more than you would have expected, right? Yeah. That's crazy. It's insane. Yeah, there was, a, there was a guy recently who survived a brown snake attack, which is, I think, Australia's most oh, dangerous yeah. snake. Um, he was doing a charity walk and he came across... A a snake that he thought was dead and it leapt up and it bit him but he survived the attack because this entire walk which was right across a huge walk in australia uh he was wearing a stormtrooper outfit uh, from star wars <laughs> and so it hit the the plate on his uh on his shin uh thing. and he made all the news in australia i'm not surprised yeah, yeah. and every single uh, every single news channel that interviewed him asked him if he was a massive star wars nerd and he went no he doesn't even <laughs> he doesn't even like star wars <laughs> it's like what is star wars i was just wearing my anti-snake suit <laughs> <laughs> yeah. wow amazing i read a list yesterday of um the 1295 venomous snakes oh. uh, as a list of them online i'm not sure it's all of them but i think it might be pretty close uh, do you want to hear some of the names? Yeah, yeah. yes, please. Okay, uh, the Moorish snake. <laughs> no. Moorish with two O's? Yeah. Or like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Not as in, once you've had one, you just can't <laughs> <Yeah>. stop. <laughs> um, the tiger cat snake, which I really like because it's like three animals in one. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a bit like, there's a hawk moth caterpillar, I think. <laughs> I think maybe it must get really upset because it's called the hawk moth caterpillar. And then when it turns into a moth, I reckon it thinks, that must be the things I turn into as I keep going on. <laughs> Spends the rest of its life waiting to become a hawk. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, it's incredible if you Google it because it can disguise itself as a snake um, in order to repel birds. And so it's like its underside has this pair of false eyes on it and it sort of causes itself to become a bit engorged where the snake head would be and if you look at pictures it looks exactly like the head of a snake wow. except that it's obviously caterpillar sized so i don't know what kind of a frightening snake is three inches long but it works that's great um the, 
They've apparently found out that snakes are actually 70 million years older than we first thought they were. These snakes sometimes were massive. Um, one of them, this is what they ate, dinosaurs. It was a wow. dinosaur-eating snake. <laughs> That's amazing. Although you did get small dinosaurs back in the day, didn't I know, you? but just the word. Yeah, yeah. It says, uh, you just it imagine ate... it kind of locking its jaws around like a diplodocus exactly, or something. Exactly, yeah. It says it, it ate small mammals, lizards, and even dinosaurs. <laughs> I read quite a cool news story from 1996 about a snake and I, I'm i going to say now I wouldn't recommend this because actually for snake bite you're not supposed to create a tourniquet because that people often think that's the oh. right thing to do but actually sometimes that can trap the venom in the wrong place and then make it more harmful than it otherwise would have been ah. however it does sometimes work in 1996 in Texas a man was bitten by a poisonous coral snake uh, he killed the reptile by biting off its head and then peeled off its skin and used it as a tourniquet to wrap around the injury. That's amazing. That's pretty hardcore, isn't it? That yeah, is it super is. Super hardcore. <laughs> you know, they can hear through. So I don't know if this is all species of snake, but they can hear through their jawbone. So their yeah. jawbone's on the ground. But what's really interesting is that their jawbone is split into two. So they can work out the direction because if the left jawbone is going, there's a little guy over there. Yeah, they can suddenly be going, oh, okay, left jawbone. All right, let's make a move. It also has two ways of smelling. And one is uh, the classic way, you know, classic snake smell (laughs) way. The other is through its tongue tasting the air. And that's how it smells. Oh. So when you see um, a snake and it's kind of sticking out its tongue, just like Anna's doing now, <laughs> it's trying to kind of see if it can taste any predators or prey. Okay. Speaking of um, being able to hear, um, do you know the death adder? No. Okay, the death adder, um, it kills um, It kills a lot of people. A lot of people are killed by it. But it's not called the death adder because of that. It used to be called the death adder. And then it just kind of got switched around. And it's because when early people went to um, Australia, they saw it and it never ran away from humans. And so they assumed that it co- just couldn't hear the humans. And so that's they thought it was death. Does no, this, it, I like it the fact of... that the death adder became the death adder due to a mishearing, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen footage of flying snakes? Oh, yeah, it's they're amazing. Phenomenal. They go a long way, don't they? They go a long way. And so their what, body... Where they, do they get flying to? So if they're off on a tree yeah. and they want to get to the ground, but they kind of want to cover some distance <laughs> while they're in the air. They always, they always fly from somewhere higher to somewhere lower. Yeah. It has to be <laughs> said. <laughs> yes. Yeah, never, never the other way. Very good point. So it's not, it's, I guess it's more a parachuting mechanism that they do because they flatten their body into a sort of spiral almost like when you see in the olympics the ribbons that they do when that ribbon display it's like that i mean birds Mm. are still laughing in their faces (laughs) yeah but give it a few million years and you won't be laughing when there are flying snakes (laughs) with wings you'll be harking back to that time of the boring billions (laughs) longing for some slime Okay, time for our final fact of the show, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that Albert Einstein has a social media team. Okay. Yeah, so he has. This is a genuinely devoted team who are paid specifically to keep up his Twitter presence, his Facebook <laughs> outputs, his Tumblr I did account. hear his Twitter presence had fallen a bit by the wayside over the past 70 years <laughs> yeah. since he died. <laughs> so yeah, if you... Anna, how does it feel to be less technologically adept to someone who's been dead for 50 years? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a fair point. So you, w- you will see on Twitter that people have set up accounts for dead historical characters. Uh, someone even has done one for God, and they run it as if they are God. Um, yeah, but that's not a verified account. Exactly. It? So it, that's the difference. Albert Einstein has a little blue tick next to his Twitter account oh. because it's a, verif- a verified account. He, on Facebook, has a little tick as well. He's got 17 million followers on Facebook. 17 million. Wow. So this is Corbus who looks after his output and they have the license to his image and as a result of the money that they get from it he is the fifth most um profitable dead person basically <laughs> he makes he's the so i think only people like maybe kurt cobain and a few others elvis elvis and maybe john lennon um yes and the fourth is uh, charles schultz who drew peanuts really because his oh. books are still so popular and still so loved but the, i th- i was very skeptical about this because i thought this sounds terrible using einstein's uh image after his death for profit it turns out that actually on his death he left uh, the rights to his image to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem which he co-founded so he said you can have the rights to my image after I die and use it to make money for the university so they licensed out to Corbis the right to use this image and Corbis take a a cut of the money basically Mm -hmm. but uh, most of it goes back to the Hebrew University so it is actually 
an odd way of uh, fulfilling your will or, yeah. you know, having a charitable legacy. They actually really care about it. The guy who runs the team at Corbis says that every day he thinks about what Einstein stands for and what he doesn't stand for. And then he sends out a tweet or he sends out a, a Facebook message reflecting what he thinks mm-hmm. Einstein might have said about a situation. Also, he corrects people who misattribute quotes to Einstein so Einstein will write back to them. In one case, he wrote to one of the Kardashians <laughs> saying, Einstein never said that. Um, so he's also doing damage yeah. limitation on on the spread of misinformation. And I just love the quote. There was a guy at Corbis, not the guy who actually runs Einstein's account, but uh, one of the managers there, uh, Kevin Connolly, who said, it's not rocket science running <laughs> Einstein's social media presence. <laughs> yeah, they also point out that no one on the Corbis team has any scientific expertise. Yeah. Right. So that, yeah. Einstein still gets five to ten requests for an autograph every day. <laughs> what? It's true. Vi- like people ask on Twitter for his autograph. I'm afraid I don't have much more detail than that. Hang but on, I suspect so- they go disappointed most of the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Einstein, those pictures of him from the 30s look old. Oh, yeah. These guys are in, and they're in black and white, so you can tell they're a long time ago. How ancient do they think this guy is? Yeah. Um... So Einstein's a bit a slightly disturbing person, right? Because he's he seems to have no flaws. Well, he has one flaw. Well... He has one flaw, but in every other way, he's so great. So all these quotes that he he said that are all so wise and brilliant. He's this great pacifist. He's a genius. If you read, you know, the I think New Scientist or Scientific American a couple of months ago did the top 10 greatest scientists of all time. And you can feel they all want to be a bit left field. But in the end, they all say Einstein's the one. <laughs> and yet he had this weird relationship with his wife. So his list of ways that his wife had to behave around him if the marriage was to function is so weird. So they, yeah, they were on the brink of a divorce and then they decided to hold the marriage together for the kids. Yeah. And in part of the deal was Einstein wrote this letter to her. And yeah. it, it's featured in the letters of notebook. If, if anyone has that, you can it see is. it. What and does it, he say? So the conditions um, of him, of them remaining together, uh, it was a contract that he wrote up that she had to sign. And uh, she had to say that she would make sure that uh, his clothes and laundry were kept in good order, that he'd get his r- three meals regularly in his room, bedroom and study kept neat, stuff like that. But then you will renounce all personal relations with me insofar as they are not completely necessary for social reasons. You will stop talking to me if I request it. That's an insane one. <laughs> <laughs> you will stop talking to me if I request it. I mean, it, this doesn't sound uh, like Andy, a... please. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this um, doesn't sound like a guy who'd be great on social media if he actually was allowed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just blocked Block, him, basically. Block. Didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> this is what he promises her in return. In return, I assure you of proper comportment on my part, such as I would exercise to any woman as a stranger. Oh. Ouch. And she signed it. What an ass. What wow. an ass. And yeah. then they divorced a couple of years later, I think. Oh, did they? Yeah. All oh, right. Couldn't keep it up. Kept on yabbering on, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know what the weirdest thing about that list is? What? It feels really awkward having to say bad stuff about Einstein. But it's yeah. true. It's this is who he was. But you really kind of, I feel almost dirty saying this out loud. But it's kind of, it's just true. Yeah. It's odd. Well, that's because of the ex- expert work being done by the folks at Corbett. <laughs> <laughs> who very rarely tweet... You will not talk to me if I request it. <laughs> so Einstein uh, was also an inventor because he worked in the patents office, didn't he? Yes. But he did a few inventions. Uh, my favorite one is a blouse with two sets of buttons sewn parallel to each other so that it would fit both a slim person and a fat person. <laughs> oh. and it's such a good idea. It means that you can use the slim buttons, and if you put on a load of weight, then you can use the fat buttons. Did he release that into the market, or did he just invent it? Uh, he invented it and patented it, but no one ever made it. I don't yeah. Because I've got um, shirt uh, cuffs where you can do the In case you put a lot of weight on your wrists. (laughs) You know, like, cake goes straight to my wrists. Um, Anyway, yeah, he had some other... He painted a hearing aid, I think, and a refrigerator. Yes. Which uh, didn't take off at the time, um, literally or metaphorically, (laughs) and wasn't really bought. But now they're thinking about reintroducing it because it's very environmentally friendly. Um, So it's actually was very ahead of his time. It's not the reason he did it, though. He did it because fridges at the time were lethal. So they all used gases like ammonia, 
uh, to actually do the cooling of the food or uh, other gases like methyl chloride. And several people died as a result of these gases leaking out into their homes, basically. Mm. So Einstein was one of several scientists who worked on fixing that. And um, in 1925, he co-developed with a former student a fridge. And he patented it. But then they invented a non-poisonous refrigerant, which just worked better. Mm. Do you know Yoda was based on Einstein? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> the guy who designed Yoda said he based it on a combination of himself and Einstein. Sure. It was Stuart Freeborn. So hang on. If one element of Yoda is taken from... Stuart? From, yeah. Yes, yeah, so from Einstein, it means that Stuart must be, be two be, foot the, tall. The, and green. The <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when Einstein became really famous and he had lectures, people really wanted to go to the lectures even though they didn't understand any of it. And so right. he would start a lecture and then stop after five minutes and say, I will now pause so that those with no further interest in the subject can leave. <laughs> <laughs> and pretty much everyone would go and there'd wow. just be like two or three people left. Wow. In Oxford, I visited it quite a few times. I didn't understand what I was looking at, but you can see the chalkboard uh, that Einstein, when he came to England to explain E equals MC squared, you can see the chalkboard where all the workings out mm. are on there. It's quite nice. It's a weird bit of history to look at. Yeah, Although amazing. weirdly, at no, nowhere on the chalkboard does it say E equals MC squared. So I just have to mm-hmm. assume that they're That's telling the truth. Uh, you were actually, definitely one of the people in the lectures, weren't you, who as soon as you sat down was like, God, five minutes, I've got to wait until he excuses me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> definitely not here for the science. Just that thing Anna was saying before about taxonomy being everywhere in the world. I guess mathematics as well is another one. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so any mathematician can talk to each other about maths by just using the symbols. Yeah. 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 You know how Einstein's brain was chopped up? Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's now an app that you can get, and I think it's for doctors, um, where they've got high-res images of the brain. Now you can download it, and you can go close into it, and you can just... And I don't know what purpose it has, because they're not quite sure how it fully fits together. I would say the main purpose is to get £2.49 off people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I mean, that's quite cool, just the idea that even his his brain is now yeah. sort of... An app. An app. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Also, uh, interestingly, so just going back to the sort of naughtier side of Einstein, um, <laughs> there's a there's an idea that his granddaughter, who was raised by Hans, which was his son, uh, was in fact an Ill- illegitimate love child of Einstein's. Wow. Her name was Evelyn. And she was actually given a bit of Einstein's brain. And the idea was that she was actually going to do a DNA checkup to see if she was related mm. because she got no money at all. Like the will, when it went to the Hebrew University, his likeness and all that stuff, they didn't give her a cut of anything. And most exciting thing about her, though, is that for a period of about 13 years, she was married to Grover Krantz, who all the uh, Bigfoot enthusiasts out there will know <laughs> is the first scientist to believe in and try to prove the existence of Bigfoot. Right. Wow. Yeah, so she was associated with two great men. <laughs> <laughs> the constant debate, who has given more to science? <laughs> Einstein or um, Grover Krantz? Can, can we do a quick thing on social media? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Social media, particularly after death. Yeah. Because yeah. there are companies now which offer to keep tweeting the kind of things that you would have tweeted... Uh, after you die so they'll take a sample of all your previous tweets and um their slogan is when your heart stops beating you'll keep tweeting (laughs) (laughs) um i read i was reading a story about these firms and there was one businesswoman who had registered her interest in having that and she said um it would be interesting to have a quote kind of ironic legacy but then she said but i'm not sure who'd be interested in reading a computer generated me in the cold light of day it is a very conceited thing to do (laughs) 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 <laughs> Which is very, I think, self-aware. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. there's another one called Eterni Me, I think, which um, you sort of can train your avatar. So it recommends that if you sign up to it, the best way to have as realistic tweeting as possible after you die is to properly train up your avatar and feed it with your whole personality. So give it all your pictures, all your tweets. And then it creates this thing that looks like you and that can, you know, speak speak to people as you would have. Wow. It's so mad. Mm. Oh, brave new world. Yeah. yeah. Um, the there there's a guy called Joe Veeks or Vikes, uh, and he is a writer for the music and pop culture website Death and Taxes, and he has. Um, Wait, sorry, did he say Death and Taxes? <laughs> 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 sorry, go on. Um, and he's kind of um, gone on to Hootsuite, which is an app which will send tweets in the future. So you can do it for a tweet next week if you're not going to be in the country. It'll just send it. 
Uh, but anyway, he has um, got some messages to be sent out in 2086, and he wants to be the last person to ever tweet. And he reckons hmm. that just Twitter, with it being an internet company, whatever, or just any company really, probably still won't be going in those times, but he will still have one last oh, tweet. Oh, wow. To go. But if Twitter doesn't exist, how will it go out? Yeah. You could still yeah. post on MySpace, even though no one's going on there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. What, wait, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag get Andy off MySpace. <laughs> um, there are some things, Twitter accounts, that make me really happy I'm not on Twitter. So one of them is the... One of them is at Schreiberland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That Schreiberland is right there on a par with the Big Ben Twitter feed. Which is fantastic. What are you talking about? Big Ben clock is so good. It's great. At one o'clock, it tweets bong. At two o'clock, it tweets bong bong. And it's been doing that for years, every yeah. hour. It's okay, so, so that's good. that's Andy's favourite Twitter feed. <laughs> really yeah, like it does it. do that. Um, one that I do like, though, is... Um, do you guys, Have you guys seen Kim Kierke Kardashian? <laughs> Kim what? Kim Kierke Kardashian. No. no. It's a combination of Kim Kardashian and Kierkegaard. Uh, and it says it's the philosophy of Kierkegaard mashed with the tweets and observations of Kim Kardashian and it includes things like filling in the eyebrows with a pencil or powder helps eliminate the imperfection that pertains to everything human (laughs) 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 it's really fun that's great it's so clever Okay, that's it. That's all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like to get in contact with any of us about the things we've said over the course of this podcast, you can get us all on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland, James at Eggshaped, Andy at Andrew Hunter M, Anna. You can email podcast at qi.com. Yep, and you can also go to no such thing as a fish.com where you can listen to all of our previous episodes. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you again next week. Goodbye.